In this demonstration, I'm going to cover two endocrine glands, the thyroid and the parathyroid. Now, whenever a clinician considers any endocrine gland, he's interested in the anatomy of the gland, but of course, he's also interested in its physiology, particularly derangements in its physiology. And that applies very well indeed to the thyroid gland. If we look at the two slides of patients, this lady has got a, a, an obvious enlargement of the thyroid gland. Uh, her thyroid function is normal. She's euthyroid. Here, our concern is the anatomy of this lady's gland. This young woman, in contrast, has also got an anatomically interesting enlargement of the thyroid. But of course, she is obviously hyperthyroid. She's got all the problems of excess of thyroxine secretion, and she's got this interesting uh, uh, condition of exophthalmos. So here, not only are we interested in the anatomy, but we're interested in the physiology of this patient's uh, thyroid problem. Now, the first thing to discuss is the embryology of the thyroid gland. It's a fascinating uh, topic because of the extraordinary migration of the thyroid gland from the base of the tongue down to its uh, anatomical position. Now, there's a very good general rule. When structures migrate embryologically, you can be sure things go wrong. We're going to see it vividly in a few moments with the thyroid. It also applies uh, to the testis, the migration of the testis down to the scrotum with its associated problems of maldescent. It applies to the kidney and urinary tract, kidney starting in the pelvis in the fetus, migrating to its definitive position with all the congenital common anomalies of kidney, ureter, particularly blood vessels to the kidney. Uh, we're going to see it vividly in a, few, in a few minutes when we talk about the parathyroid gland. So let's now talk about the thyroid itself. I'll show you this uh, on the next slide. Here in blue is the thyroid in its normal, usual anatomical position, tethered to the side of the trachea and to the larynx. As the larynx moves on swallowing, the thyroid moves with it. So any swelling of the thyroid gland, you can detect at once, because that swelling is the only lump in the neck that will move on swallowing. We'll talk about that later. But now let's look at the embryology. The thyroid gland commences at the dorsum of the tongue, junction of the anterior two-thirds and posterior third, at a little dimple called the foramen cecum. Cecum means a blind ending pit. The foramen cecum, the blind foramen. It migrates along a track, the thyroglossal track, down closely related to the hyoid bone. So closely related to it that when I was a student, we were taught that it, the track actually passes through the developing hyoid bone. It doesn't. It just tethers against the back of the hyoid bone. Never mind. It's closely related to the hyoid. It then descends down to its definitive position. And it leaves behind embryological remnants of great clinical interest. You may find thyroid tissue at, on the back of the tongue, at the junction of the, post, of the anterior two-thirds, posterior third, in the region of the foramen cecum, a lingual thyroid. There may be a, a par partial bit of thyroid tissue, may even be the whole of the thyroid. This you can't mistake that for anything else. It's very unusual. I've only seen two examples of this in 40 years of clinical experience, but there it is.
Much more commonly, we'll see this phenomenon. Here's a woman with a lump uh, in the neck. When she swallows, it moves on swallowing. It's a part of the thyroid apparatus, let's say. We ask the patient to open the mouth, and we say to the patient, put your tongue out. When she protects her tongue, the gland moves upwards. When she puts her tongue back again, the lump goes downwards. When she puts her tongue out, it moves upwards. It's attached, this lump is attached to the thyroglossal tract. When we operate on the patient, there's her thyroglossal cyst. But just removing that cyst isn't good enough. We had to go on and excise the track as it went up and up. This is a little bit of the hyoid with the muscles at the back of it. It's so closely att attached to the hyoid, you can't dissect it off the hyoid bone. You have to take out a little bit of the central portion, the body of the hyoid with its attached muscles. And that isn't sufficient because you've then got to continue the dissection up and up and up and up and up and up and up to the base of the tongue. By the way, you'll see this patient, in addition, had this extension of the thyroglossal tract. This is, I'll show you this in a few minutes, this is a bit of pyramidal lobe. It's important to remove the whole of this tract system. If you just remove the cyst and leave this behind, the patient isn't at all happy because this track goes on discharging mucousy material out through the wound. It gets infected. They get abscesses in the neck, discharging pus. Uh, they have a miserable time if you don't remove the whole of the thyroglossal tract. Now, this is a patient on whom I did a partial thyroidectomy for a large nodular goiter, isthmus, lateral lobes, and you'll see here a very common phenomenon. Hmm? I showed you it in the other picture. There's the pyramidal lobe. More often on the left than the right. I suppose it's present in about 40% of specimens that you look at. And of course, this represents, so to say, the, the terminal stalk of the thyroglossal tract, the thyroglossal duct. Then, of course, things can go too far, and not rarely the thyroid will descend behind the manubium sterni, down, 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 into the superior mediastinum. And here is a, a, a plain x-ray of the chest with this large mass, which is a very large retrosternal goiter. Not an uncommon phenomenon. In fact, there's a very good aphorism that the commonest cause of a superior mediastinal mass on x-ray is a retrosternal goiter. 